stand our feet. We covet your word, Lord God. Help us to take it in and to live it. And we just pray that you will be blessed today by what you see and what you hear. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. You may be seated. Hey, listen, 
we want to invite you Wednesday evening to Bible study and potluck. Um, this uh, Wednesday evening, we're going to have potluck at 6. And it's always really, really good. We've got plenty of food, okay? And then Bible studies at 6.45. And I think Brother Bill Gallagher is going to come and bring the study. I've got to call him and make sure that he's doing okay. He's going to have surgery here pretty quick. So we'll see if he's so good. Hey, listen, we still need at least one person, preferably two, to learn how to operate the sound booth back there, okay? It's a ministry we've got. Uh, Jeremy does a fine job, but if he's not available or something, then, uh, well, then we're in trouble. So um, we'd like to have a couple of volunteers to help with that. It's not hard. Uh, I'm saying that because I don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not hard. If you're good at running if you're uh, scared of buttons, there's a lot of them back there, but uh, no, he'll, he'll teach you, we'll, Jeremy will teach you how to do it. Hey, another thing too, listen, and I'm serious about this, we need at least a couple of volunteers to help with our kids. This is a ministry. You know, Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Anyone who, you know, tries to lead a kid astray, it's better for them to have a millstone tied around their neck and dropped into the deepest part of the sea. And if Jesus is was so, um, if he was, if he considered that part so important, how much more important does he consider just telling kids about Jesus? Just tell, how many of you learned about Jesus in Sunday school? Raise your hand. Take a look around. Almost everyone. And what would it have been like if there hadn't been a teacher or helper? You know, maybe some of you wouldn't be here this morning. So uh, I just I just think that it's only once a month, and if we get enough volunteers, it might not even be once a month. It might be once every six weeks or something. So please, I don't care how old you are, I don't care if you're male or female, please see Debbie. Uh, after church and just tell her, hey, I'm available for that week or uh, whatever, okay? It's, it's really important. Um, all right, let's see. So May 5th, we're gonna have our uh, annual meeting and we, of course, that's open to anyone, especially members. Uh, we wanna thank Heaven Sent for the flowers. They're sure beautiful, aren't they? You bet. And there is a, um, <laughs> That was not for me, that was for you. <laughs> That's okay, just making things clear. Here's your a calendar for May, so you can uh, take a look at that. And there are um, there are places on the announcement here on the back where you can take notes if you want to take notes. Okay. Let's continue to worship this morning. Look in your hymnal number 358 in the because he lives. And uh, go ahead and remain seated and relax here for a little while. And let's just lift this up to the Lord this morning. In your hymnal 358.
victory in Jesus. 353 years.
conviction, but it's a spirit of comfort. What would we do without your Holy Spirit, Lord? What would we do without Jesus Christ? Oh Lord, thank you for everything. Lord Jesus, thank you for your precious life here on the face of this earth, for your horrific death for each one of us, for your resurrection from the dead, which gives us eternal life, for your ascension into heaven, which gives us a picture of what's going to happen soon, and for your intercession to the Father, which guarantees an answer to our prayers. Oh Lord, we just thank you for everything. We pray that you'll bless every church services everywhere that are speaking your truth by means of your Holy Spirit. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, that, that music was beautiful this morning. I don't you think, but man, it just sounded so good, did it not? You know, you don't got to be rolling in the floor to have the Holy Spirit here, do you? It's here. That's right. So, Father in heaven, thank you so much for your blessings, for giving us so much, Lord. You're just absolutely amazing. Your, your grace and your mercy, your kindness, generosity to us, your your faithfulness, your righteousness and justice, holiness and purity, your sense of fairness and judgment, your power, your knowledge, your wisdom and discretion. Thank you for everything, Lord. Thank you that you've blessed us so much and allowed us just to live in this country, Lord. We do pray for our country, Lord. We hold it up to you. There's a lot to be done, Lord God, and we just pray that your Holy Spirit will do what needs to be done in our country to bring it back into a country that uh, that at least does the right things. We'll pray that, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Please bless this offering and multiply it to this community. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs>
Thank you so much. That was wonderful. You guys want to hear the word God? Yes. You sure? Yes. Okay. All right. You're going to get what you asked for. So, Father in heaven, we, indeed, we do want to hear the word of God. We want to gain faith by our hearing of this word as promised in the book of Romans. Lord God, please lead us and guide us. Grant us your wisdom and discretion. Help us to have your knowledge. And help us to do something with us, Lord. Help us to live our lives in obedience and love to you. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, what happened May 15th, 2019, that was a nat nat natural and national disaster? Does anybody know? I can, I can hear you now. I had to pay my taxes, right? That's, that's what happened on April 15th. Yeah. April 15th, 2019, we all watched on television as the Cathedral of Notre Dame burned down. It didn't burn to the ground, but it, it really caused some severe damage. Something that took 100 years to build took 15 hours to destroy. And it was amazing. We watched as the over 200 foot tower, the spire that was on top, burned and fell to the ground. And in some sense, it was, you know, kind of devastating to all of us because it was such a, a beautiful building, such a, a icon of France. And yet, you know, I think of this circumstance as possibly representing the condition of the church today. And I'll explain that to you in a minute. You know, it's interesting that the cathedral, see in, in, in America we call it Notre Dame. In France they say Notre Dame. So melodious and perfect. But it's, it started to be built in 1163, it was finished in 1260, almost 100 years. When it burned, it was 860 years old. It was considered French Gothic uh, construction. They had three pipe organs there. Fortunately, they did survive. The biggest of it had 8,000 pipes in it. Is that crazy? They had 10 bronze bells and they did survive, but they ended up melting them down and making brand new bells. I think it's interesting that bronze was used because bronze is the metal of judgment in the Bible. It is said, they said, okay, that they had on display there the original crown of thorns that Jesus wore and that they had a sliver and one nail from his cross. Now, I don't think that's true. I think the crown of thorns was probably lost long, long time ago. And I, as far as the sliver from the crown of, uh, from the cross, I mean, they, they used and reused and used and reused those crosses probably thousands of times after Jesus did. It's interesting, when they built the church, they had to excavate it. And right where they built the church, they found that there was a Roman temple to the God of Jupiter. Yeah, interesting. The newspapers and the newscasts said this about the tragedy. They said Notre Dame, Notre Dame is a spiritual gift to humanity. Another newscast said that Notre Dame is a symbol of Christianity in France. And Nancy Pelosi, one of our very favorite people, <laughs> said that Notre Dame is the beating heart of France. Well, if that's true, then I'm thinking maybe France, the world, including the United States of America, has some problems. Go with me, if you want to, to Jeremiah chapter 6. I'll be in there for a while. They are rebuilding the cathedral there. They've, uh, it's just, if you, if you haven't watched the process, it's amazing. 
they, the government of France owns that property and they lend it out to the Catholic Church for their uh, services, even though it's mostly a tourist attraction more than anything. And um, it's interesting because the cathedral there is almost done. They, they insisted that it be rebuilt exactly like the original, which means they didn't use any power tools. They didn't use any nails. They, they, they put everything together with plugs in the wood and everything. And some of these beams were huge. They imported contractors from around the world that had specialties in this type of thing. And uh, they estimate that it will be finished this year in December, December 8th, at a cost of somewhere slightly below a billion dollars. Now, if you don't know what a billion dollars is, it's a lot of money, okay? Yeah. So in Jeremiah chapter six, and what I want you to think about today, okay, is this, as we read these scriptures, I've got several scriptures I want to share with you. What I want to read to you and what I want to, us to think about is this. What is the spiritual condition of the church today? Okay? In our country, around the world, and what is the spiritual condition of each one of us in our heart? Because as the church goes, okay, we go. As we go, the church goes. You know why? The church isn't the building, is it? The church is you. The church is me. So this message is for me as well it is, as it is for you. Jeremiah chapter 6, starting in verse 10, says this. This is God speaking through the prophet Jeremiah. And he says, To whom can I speak and give warning? Who will listen to me? Their ears are closed so they cannot hear. The word of the Lord is offensive to them. They find no pleasure in it. Wow. You know, the word of the Lord is offensive to a lot of people today, isn't it? And we're seeing that the word of the Lord is under attack. Let me read something else. You don't have to turn there because I'll be done with it by the time you find it. But it's in Amos chapter 8. And listen to what God says through the prophet Amos. He says, In that day declares the sovereign Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. Can you think of a time when that happened? Crucifixion? Yeah. During the crucifixion from 12 noon to 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the, dirt, the, the darkness covered the whole world. That's amazing, isn't it? He says this. He goes on down in verse 11. He says, the days are coming. Now remember, this was written several thousand years ago, but it most certainly applies today. It says, the days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land. Not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Men will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. Now that's, I mean, that's a terrible thing to think about. You know, Romans chapter 1, and you don't necessarily have to turn there if you want, don't want to. We'll be back in Jeremiah, but Romans chapter 1, you're welcome to turn there before. We've read this scripture. This is, it's amazing because Today, after I got finished um, kind of finishing my studies up, I turned the television on, and I don't have you, any of you ever watched Jack Hibbs? Yes, yeah. Jack Hibbs is awesome. And I turned it on, and he says, well, if you'll turn to Romans chapter 1, I says, hey, wait a minute, Jack. That's my scripture for the day. So listen to what God says through Paul in Romans chapter 1. He says, the wrath of God, now that's the righteous anger of God. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against 
all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by the wickedness. It's interesting, I think the King James Version says that they hold the truth in unrighteousness. And what they're saying here is that the truth is being held down. It's being suppressed. It's being changed. It's being altered. It's being added to or subtracted from. It's being disguised. And that is happening today. The book of Revelation specifically in the last chapter says anyone who adds to the words of this book or anyone who takes the words away, let there be a special curse on them. That's pretty serious. He goes on, he says this. Let me read it to you again. The wrath of God, the anger of God, the righteous anger of God is being revealed. Now, remember, this was written around uh, a couple thousand years ago, roughly. And it's a present tense. It says it is being revealed, which means the wrath of God was being revealed then, and the wrath of God is being revealed now. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them. Did you know that? God has made His character, His power, His integrity, He's made it known to all men. It's going to tell us how. Listen. It says, for since the creation of the world, so that's a long time, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that men are without <coughs> excuse. Non-Christians today will have no excuse when they come up before God in judgment. Christians today will have no excuse when they stand before the bema seat of Jesus Christ and rewards are being handed out. Remember something. There's no born-again Christian that will ever stand before the great white throne of God. That's where God judges unbelievers. And the great question there will be, what have you done with my son? And when an unbeliever says, well, nothing, then he will hear the words, depart from me, I never knew you. Now, so let me read a couple more scriptures to you and think about this, the devolution of men, devolution. Man, mankind, thinks that we're evolving. Okay? We're evolving. We started out as an amoeba in a, uh, a primordial soup of something along Highway 62. <laughs> And we evolved into what we are now. Or, if you don't like that, you started out as a monkey and went through the stages and now you're just a smart monkey. Okay? Or if you don't like that, you started out as a fish in the sea and you learned how to walk on land and pretty soon you, you became this and you became that and pretty soon you're a man and, or a woman and wow. You know what? It takes more faith to believe that C-R-A you fill it blank that it does to believe that a loving God created us in his own image. It really does. It takes more faith. It does take more faith to believe in that. Let me read to you a couple more scriptures real quick. 1 Timothy 4, one. So, the point I'm making here, I want to make sure you get it, okay, is this, is that we are, as a society right now, devolving. Okay, we're devolving as a society. We're not evolving. And the Word of God and church attendance and all of those things are devolving. They're not evolving. Satan had quite a victory over this COVID thing. Because COVID cost uh, most churches, I won't say all churches, but most churches, 
at least a minimum of 25% of their people left. And a lot of them have to come back. In our church, we went from roughly 130 to 150 attendees every Sunday to 70. And now God continues to build us back up to where we're getting close back to 100 again, which is awesome. Here's what it says in 1 Timothy. You don't have to turn there because I'm not going to be here very long. Paul writing to Timothy, the Spirit, speaking of the Holy Spirit, clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Whew. That's bad. They will abandon the faith and it says they will follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. The study of spirits and demonology is a very, very interesting study. I can't go into it, I won't go into it, this morning, but if you come on Wednesday night and you study Revelation, you'll get some of that teaching. I taught about the um, uh, the angelic conflict many years ago, and this was included. I did a teaching called The Big Picture, which took us also a couple of years, which had it in it. But did you know that demons need to have something to possess? They need a body. That's when Jesus said or to the to the uh, the man in the Gadarenes, he says, uh, he says, come out of there. And the spirit says, hey, you know, let us, let us go into the pigs. And they did. That's why the spirit says, when, the Bible says, when a spirit leaves a man, okay, and he doesn't clean up his act with God, then that spirit takes seven additional spirits and they come in and make a mess that's worse than the first mess that was made. We have today, in churches, unfortunately, we have the doctrine of demons. And I will tell you some of it, okay? Name it and claim it. Really? You know, Jesus could have named it and claimed it. He told his disciples, I can name a legion of angels right now to come and rescue me. But if he would have done that, where would you and I be? We would be unsaved. We would be bound for hell. How about the doctrine that says uh, every Christian should be wealthy. And if you send us your thousand dollar pledge, God will return it in spades to you. Now the only thing that I can say is that the people who send in their thousand dollar pledge, generally speaking, are a thousand dollars less money. And the people who are on the receiving end of that are $1,000 richer. Now, that's not to say we don't give to church. Obviously, there's electric bills, there's, there's salaries to pay, etc., etc. You, you know, you got to give. This isn't a sermon about giving. People, I respect people who give of their time and their energy and their prayers as much as I respect someone who gives of their money. It's easy to give for... With, uh, from, it's easy to give money because you can just go out and make some more, right? But it's a little harder to give of your time, like I was talking about with the kids, because you, you can't manufacture any more time. The time that you have is the time you have. Second Timothy, let me read this to you. Second Timothy chapter 1. I believe it's chapter 1. Maybe not, chapter 4. Listen to what it says, Okay? In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. Okay, this sounds like it might be pretty serious. Who will judge the living and the dead. And in view of his appearing and his kingdom, Paul says to Timothy, I give you this charge. Now Paul is not only writing to Timothy, but he's writing to you and me. So he's not only giving Timothy this charge, he's giving you and me this charge. He says, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. He says, for the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. That time is here. 
Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside the myths. But you, he says to Timothy, and he says to you and me, but you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, <clears throat> discharge all the duties of your ministry. You know, it's true that you and I do have a ministry. Now, my ministry just happens to be right now sitting up here and ministering to you. Okay? Your ministry may be uh, singing in the choir, it may be cleaning the church, it may be uh, working this or that, it may be praying for people, I mean, it may be working in the kitchen. I mean, there's a hundred different ministries for a hundred different people. There really are. God's designed a ministry. It says in Corinthians that we have a ministry of reconciliation. What does that mean? It means that you and I are tasked, tasked, <laughs> with, okay, with the ministry of trying to bring people to God. Unbelievers or believers? Both. We just read that many will uh, leave the faith in the last days. So many churches have chosen entertainment over doctrine. The preaching of the gospel now is old-fashioned. Now we preach creature comfort, and we preach, you know, self. You should be, you should be aware of yourself, and you should be wealthy, and blah blah blah. You know, Jesus said that foxes have holes in the ground, right, and birds have nests in the air or the trees, but the Son of Man doesn't have a place to lay his head. He had to depend upon the goodwill of others. Oops, somebody's not happy. <laughs> you know, Jesus was rich, but not from an earthly standpoint. You and I are rich. Ephesians chapter 1 says, We have been given all of the riches in heaven. We have this big, fat, heavenly checkbook that we can write out checks whenever we want to. We have a 24-7 prayer line to God. We have the Word of God written in our own language. What excuse do we have for not doing those things? If you offer one, it's not going to be, it's not going to be considered. It just isn't. And you know, I don't want to get to heaven and try to come up with some excuse. I just want to get to heaven and I want to have at least one crown, okay, at least one crown to put at Jesus' feet. <clears throat> Did you know that there is a crown promised to those who look forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ? Yes. That's a crown you and I can have. Anyone can have that crown. I'm looking forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's a crown you can have. That's a crown you can lay at Jesus' feet. Listen to what Jeremiah chapter 6 says. Here, it says this in verse 13. Now listen carefully. It says, From the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain. Now he's talking here about false prophets. Prophets and priests alike, alike all practice deceit. They dress the wound of my people as, the, as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. Are they ashamed of their loathsome conduct? No. They have no shame at all. They do, they do not even know how to blush. So they will fall among the fallen. They will be brought down when I punish them. It's very interesting because in 1970, 90 percent of people in America claim to be Christian. When you ask them, what religion are you? They would say Christian. Okay? In 2007, it lowered to 78%. In 2022, it's down to 63%. And they figure in a few short years it'll be below 50%. 
for a country that was at least founded on Judeo-Christian principles, okay, for us to be below 50%. Now, these are people who are just claiming to be Christians. These aren't people who are really Christians. You have to be born again to be a Christian. These are people who just say, oh yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Christian. I mean, what are they going to say, a Muslim? No. <laughs> Some will say I'm an atheist. Some will say I'm an agnostic. Did you know there's no such thing as a atheist? Because to be an atheist, you'd have been every single place in the universe searching for God and coming to the conclusion that there is no God. So there's no such thing as an atheist. At the best, they're agnostic. What they're saying is, I really don't know if there's a God or not. Okay? In 2007, 16% of Americans claimed nothing, that they were nothing. They were atheists or agnostic or they just were nothing. A short time later, today, in 2022, 29% say that they're nothing. Almost a third of people in the United States of America say that they're not anything. In 2022, 20% of Americans went to church every Sunday. And 10% went almost every Sunday. Okay? In 2000... Let's see, hold on. Oh. In 2022, okay, that was 20% said that they go to church every, every Sunday, and 10% they said they go to church almost every Sunday. But 51% of Americans said they never go to church or very seldom go to church. We saw that here on Easter. We see it at Christmas. Man, Christmas and Easter, man, if you could if you could have those kind of attendance figures every week, wow, I mean, the churches would be so healthy, wouldn't they? It'd be awesome. Luke chapter 18, verse 8 says this, Jesus speaking, when the Son of Man comes, will he find the faith on the earth? You wonder. You know, we study the book of Revelation. And when Revelation gets to the midpoint, and we see the trumpets and the bold judgment sound, that will be a time when God's patience and God's grace comes to an end. He's going to say, I'm done. And he's going to let people have what they want. It says in Revelation chapter 9, at the end, it says that people will not repent. They will not stop worshiping demons. They will not stop their magic arts, their drug use, etc., etc. That's how hard they will be. In fact, we know that from the book of Revelation and from other books in the Bible, that there will be a contingent of people in the world that will actually arm themselves and try to fight against Jesus Christ. Now, if that ain't the height of stupidity, I don't know what is. Okay? Let's see. You know, I'm going to get my AR-15. I'm going to get four or five clips. And if Jesus comes back, I'm going to take care of things. Really? Guess what? All Jesus has to do, and it says this in the Bible, all he has to do is speak the word. Speak the word. And you know what? Boom. Done deal. Well... Let me read a couple other things to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 says this, and this is something that we all need to think about. It says, examine yourselves. Okay, Give yourself a test, it says, to see whether you are in the faith. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes through hearing and hearing the word of God. Jeremiah 6.16, 6, listen to what this says, okay? I'm going to read Jeremiah 6.16-19. 6, to 19. It says, this is what the Lord says. Now, since it says this is what the Lord says, probably ought to be underlined or highlighted in your Bible. Of course, probably two-thirds or four-fifths of your Bible should be highlighted, right? It's getting to the point where I'm just going to have to buy a Bible that's all highlighted. <laughs> and then I'll have to start erasing all the important verses, right? This is what the Lord says. Stand at the, cross, uh, stand at the crossroads and look. 
Aren't we at the crossroads today? And how many of us have been or are at the crossroads of life? How many of us in our lives have been at a crossroads where we had to look? It says, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. I appointed watchmen over you and said, listen to the sound of the trumpet. But you said, we will not listen. Therefore, hear, O nations. Observe, O witnesses, what will happen to them. Hear, O earth. So he's talking about, he's talking to everyone here. I am bringing disaster on this people, the fruit of their schemes, because they have not listened to my words and have rejected my law. We read in Ephesus chapter 2 and chapter 3, the seven letters to the churches. And just, I'm not going to go over, but just think about this for just a minute. To the church at Ephesus, he said, you have left your first love. You left it. You didn't lose it. You left it. He says to the church at Pergamum and Thyatira, he says that you've committed idolatry, sexual immorality. Boy, we see that prevalent in the churches today. The church of Sardis, he just said, you're dead. Well, I don't know about you, but that's pretty serious. And Laodicea, which I think more represents our time, our church age today, okay? He said this, he says, you're lukewarm. You're worldly. You're hypocritical. James chapter 1, verse 22 says, do not mere, merely listen to the word of God and deceive yourselves. Do what it says. You know, it's one thing to be deceived. We've all had somebody that's deceived us in our lives, right? A business partner, perhaps a, a relationship of some type that, you know, you just, you just got deceived. But how much worse is it to deceive yourself? Deceive yourself. It says, James tells us, he says, do not merely listen to the word of God and deceive yourself. Do what it says. <laughs> Hebrews 11.6 Without faith it is impossible to please God. Matthew chapter 13 verse 58 Jesus is speaking here or they're speaking of Jesus. He said he did not do many miracles there. That was his hometown because of their lack of faith. Let me read something to you here out of James chapter 2 and we'll finish with this scripture and one more and here's what it says James chapter 2 I'm going to start in verse 14 now listen again you know what is it what did Paul say to Timothy he said preach the word in season and out of season I interpret that Steve's interpretation of that is when you feel like it or when you don't Okay? Preach the word. Be ready. Be ready to encourage people. Correct if you have to. Rebuke if you have to. But make sure that you do it encouragingly. Okay? None of us, not one of us, are free from sin. The Bible says if a person thinks that they are not a sinner, they are deceived and the truth is not in them. So it says in 1 John. Listen to what James tells us. This is the half-brother of the Lord who did not believe that Jesus was the Savior until after the resurrection. He says, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Question. He's going to ask several rhetorical questions here. He says, now he's going to give us a, a, a situation here. Think about it. He says, suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well. But does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, is it, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds. 
and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe and they tremble. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Now he's going to give us evidence. Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteousness, righteous, excuse me, for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that said Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You know, when I pray and when I think about you know, my relationship with the Lord, I think of myself as a servant. Okay? A servant. Now the Bible says that you and I are sons of God. We're, we're God's family. And that's an exalted position, in my opinion. And you know what it says in Hebrews? It says that Jesus is not afraid to call his people brothers. Technically, you and I are brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. Now, how dynamic is that? How valuable is that? I want you to think about something for just a minute. Jesus Christ. Christ, God, okay, God spent the most valuable substance in the universe to save your soul, my soul. That substance was the blood of Jesus Christ. The most valuable. Now, if he did that, then how valuable are you and I to him? We're pretty valuable, aren't we? God loves us. That's what the Bible says. God loves us. Is it really such a hard thing to love him back? And you know how you prove love? It says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, it says, you prove that you love God by obeying him. Not obeying part of his word. You know, I like this part, but I don't like this part. When I was a really young Christian, I was a lot more bold than I am now. I met a guy that said, and kind of a, he was a character. He says, you know, he says, yeah, I believe the Bible, but I don't believe this part. I said, oh, really? And I, he says, I don't believe that part either. I said, really? I said, well, what else don't you believe? He said, well, I have trouble with this and trouble with that. And I said, well, let me see your Bible. And he says, okay. And so I said, which part didn't you believe? Tore a page out. What other part didn't you believe? Tore a page out. What else would you like me to tear out of this thing? Either believe the whole thing or believe none of it. Either obey God in everything or don't obey Him in anything. He that is with me gathers. He that is against me scatters. Are you a scatterer or are you a gatherer? I said last week, and I'll say it again, if you hate a hundred people, you're a hater. If you hate one person, you're a hater. The Bible says that if you look on a woman with the eyes of adultery, you're an adulterer, right? If you, in your mind, assassinate someone's character, are you a murderer? In God's eyes, I would assume you are. Well, let me finish up here. Let me read one thing to you. In, this is the last one. In Peter, this is a beautiful, beautiful scripture. And it's something that um, we should absolutely think about. It's in 2 Peter. I want you to notice the progression here. Okay, there's a progression. This is actually a formula that God gives us. 2 Peter chapter 1. It's about faith. It starts with faith. And it ends with love. Now listen. It says, in, I'll start a couple of verses ahead. This is Peter writing. He says, His divine power has given us almost everything we need for life and godliness. Excuse me? Oh, oh. 
Oh, His divine power has given us everything we need. How much is everything? It's everything, isn't it? How much is all? That's all. How much has God given us? All. He's given us everything. You got that? His divine power. It's His choice. He chose to give us everything we need for life and godliness. How? Through our knowledge of Him, He called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, through what? Through His knowledge, through His glory, through His goodness, through His will, through these He has given us His very great and precious promises. So that through them, the promises, okay, you may participate in the divine nature. You know what that means? You can actually become more like God. You can actually become more like Jesus Christ. Isn't that the goal? Isn't that the goal here? It says, not only that, but you can escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. He says, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith. Now the Bible says every single person has been given a measure of faith. You and I, we each have a measure of faith. We're born, when we're born again, we're born with it. And I'll go so far as to say that even a non-believer has to have some measure of faith. Because as a non-believer, I'm not going to get into the deep teachings about the Word of God. There's only one thing I need to know as a non-believer. Jesus Christ died on the cross for me. He rose again from the dead three days later. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And He's ever living to make intercession for me. That's all I need to know as an unbeliever. The rest of it will come as a believer. He says, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith. So we got the faith. Goodness. Note the progression here. And to goodness, knowledge. Get in the Word. Come Wednesday night. Find out what the Word says. And to knowledge, self-control. And to self-control, perseverance, patience under pressure. And to perseverance, godliness. Oh, we're getting closer now. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. What's the two greatest commandments that all the 613 are fall under? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. That's mental, physical, and spiritual, and emotional. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. I was thinking about that the other day, that scripture. You know, there must not be a lot of people that love themselves. When you think about it. I never thought about loving myself. But yet, don't we love ourselves when we eat our favorite foods? Or when we buy our vehicles that we like or come to the church that we, we identify with or get married to the person that you are attracted to? Don't we... In, in essence, aren't we loving ourselves by doing those things? There must not be a lot of people who love themselves. You know why? Because they don't love their neighbor. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. He says this, For if you possess these qualities, the ones I just listed for you, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, what does that mean? You're growing, right? It means you're growing. In increasing measure, they, these qualities, will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's a good formula. Listen to the, to the opposite of it. But, here's your contrast. If anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, my brothers, he's writing to Christians, 
Be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, is Christianity a picture of the cathedral of Notre Dame? Notre Dame. Where it's beautiful on the outside, but it's destroyed on the inside. I hope not. I mean, listen. Listen. We are what God has here on the face of the earth. We are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its saltiness, it says it, just throw it out. It's no good. If Christians lose their way, what kind of impact are we going to have on this world? Obviously, according to the statistics that I read you, okay, Obviously, we are having less and less impact on the world, aren't we? Why? Because the world is doing this in terms of Christianity. Let's have an impact on our community. Let's start right here in Eagle Point, White City, Sam's Valley, Shady Cove. Thank God we're a long way from Ashton. <laughs> They needed to, I know, I know. <laughs> Pray with me, would you? Dear Father in heaven, please forgive me for my sins. Please cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Give me a hunger for your word. Help me with my faith. Help me to obey you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks for your patience. I didn't think that was going to go that long, but you know me. I can't shortchange you. As we worship this morning, and uh, as uh, Brother Steve did the sermon, I was reminded of one of my favorite verses. In Second Chronicles verse seven or chapter seven verse fourteen it says, "If my people, you got this is a really smart church, so you guys can a lot of you guys can recite it. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin, and I will heal their land." So in thinking about that, there's a course that I love that kind of brought back um, a couple of years ago. We can stand and be dismissed with it. It's called uh, Lord Listen to Your Children Praying. And if you know this one, just sing it out. And if you don't, we'll go through it twice. So you'll get it figured out. But it goes like this. It goes, Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Something's gonna happen. The Lord's gonna take control. When the children of the Lord kneel down to pray, When the children of the Lord kneel down, kneel down to pray. Oh, Lord, listen to your children pray. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children pray. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Thank you, and uh, we also want to remind people that we are having an all-church meeting next week after the service.
And one of the things that will be voted on during that meeting will be the church budget. So there are copies of the next year's church budget, uh, which we'll be voting on next week. And there's only about 25 copies, so we ask that you take maybe one per family, not one for per person, but one per family. And you're welcome to look that over so that you know we can all be on the same page come next week. Yeah, and be vote. prepared to bring your $1,000 uh, donation. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hey, listen, um, if any of you need to have any uh, encouragement or if any of you want to join our church or if anyone's here that doesn't know the Lord, uh, we're here up here just to help you. So God bless you. Have a great Sunday afternoon. Eat a good lunch and uh, we'll see you Wednesday night.